if I'm in a plane, okay, and the guy next to me is praying, <laughs> okay, and just so happens to use to to, to verbalize Allah hey. Akbar, dun, dun, dun. listen, and it just Danger so happens, zone. whatever, whatever, we won't what, need an air what, No, whatever. <laughs> listen, if if I am sitting there oh, and all of a sudden my na- my neighbor starts verbalizing Allah Akbar, that guy's getting his fucking ass. Kicked. Episode thirty-seven. What's up, guys? Haven't it been? Uh, fuck, it's been about a month. Yeah, a bit. Yeah. So today we have an interviewer. We're interviewing somebody. He's 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 missing right now. He's uh, finishing up a meeting in our conference room. So he'll 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 walk in when we uh, when he gets done. But um, we'll get the party started. Um, what what has changed since last time we spoke? Interest rates down. Interest rates quite a bit. Down. Yeah. Well, they, which new but nobody nobody um nobody was predicting i mean you know what i've also realized in this whole shit let me tell you something that i've absolutely i, I am positive going. of nobody knows shit <laughs> nobody knows shit let me tell you what happens let me tell you what happens every time everybody makes predictions mm-hmm. right they stick it they throw it on the wall right mm-hmm. then somebody's gonna be right yeah right somebody's gonna be right so when that happens, the guy who actually predicted it, he's the one that's right. That, yeah, but it doesn't genius. mean that he knows shit. It just means that that's just the way it landed. Like, everybody was predicting rates were going to go down next year. Everybody. All the fucking experts that are shut up right now. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to name them all, but, I mean, like, guys that know. Supposedly next year, you know, second quarter, third quarter, rates are going to go down. Rates are already going down. Mm-hmm. Right? Nobody knows shit. Well, but what? The, the thing is that when you say rates are going down, like the Fed hasn't reduced rates. Right. So what happens is that that as usual, the information that that people get is incomplete. Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't even matter if it's accurate. Yeah, they're, or not. But they're definitely not raising. It's a, well, they haven't raised rates. There's a right. meeting coming up now in the first couple right. weeks of December, and it is widely expected that the Fed will not raise the prime right. rate again. But what happens is that what, what nobody understands is how it actually works. How the cake so so that's uh, why when you say the cake is made. Yeah. That's why the, the, the we sausage. we sit here and we're like, yeah, rates have gone down. You know, like mortgage. That's all rates, I care about in my right, world. I get it, but, gone but, down. but but I get it, but nobody understands what that means. People are listening to us and like, what the fuck are you guys talking about? The the Fed hasn't reduced rates, and it's like, no man. But what the Fed does is just one piece of this much larger sure. machinery that is what results in the rate that you're quoted when you go buy a house. So what Jesus is saying, and he's correct, is that two months ago, let's say, if you went to buy a house, the rate you were being quoted is higher. People are getting stuff in the sixes right now. Right. Is higher than the rate you're going to be quoted if you try to buy a house with financing today. But but for most of the world, you know, or, or the United States, right, the people, you know, that th- he, hear about rates, they're like, no, rates aren't dropping. Rates are, are insanely high right now. Right. And so it's <laughs> and it's like it's just it's incomplete. For, forget about right or wrong. It's incomplete. Everything is fucking incomplete. Like I, 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 you just I, can't give people enough information because, number one, they don't want to hear it. And number two, they don't get it. Well, I, I think that it's that the information is not easily attained either. I mean, like I teach Agreed. real estate agents on a regular basis. Right. It's not that they don't want to know. It's that nobody even tells them because they just assume that they can't figure it out. Just like on most commercial mortgages, they're index based rates. The residential mortgages is an index-based rate, and the index it's based upon, at least in the major governmental ones, is the yield in the 10-year treasury, which is set by the bond market, right? The rate at which people are buying and selling these bonds and what they're paying for them. So when the anticipata- anticipation of, rent in- uh, of rate increases changes, people change what their decisions are as far as investing in these bonds go. The anticipation is that the Fed is maybe done raising rates, so the outlook for these rates continue to go up has changed and people now are making different investment decisions in the bond market. And this is allowing the rate on the 10 year treasury bond to come down, which is resulting in our our mortgage interest rates being at a lower number. It's, it's not it's not that crazy complex. But here's the thing if the Fed does raise rates at the next meeting, watch them go higher, watch the rates go higher than they were. Right. It's all connected. It's all connected. And uh 
and yeah, and the gentlemen's uh, the, the 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 guys that I was talking about that were quoting stuff. We're just talking about like our market, right? Our, sure. our market, and and uh, you know, and again, you know, it's it's weird. It, I always have in my mind whenever I talk about something, I always gotta like almost exclude Miami from it, right? Because let me tell you, man, I I'm, I have people from other parts of the country, and and uh, we're we're in a nice little bubble here. I mean, yeah, we're in a nice place. You know, we're in, we're in a nice bubble right now. Um. I mean, I'm not, I'm not seeing, I'm seeing slowdown, but I'm not seeing price decreases. No, in fact, there was an article the other day that um, home sales in like Miami Dade slowed and and were less than like you know last year at this time, year before yeah, at this time, definitely. But but prices right. were continuing to rise. Yep. Yeah, and I was just talking about it this morning at a at a meeting I was in before this that it's like. Jeff Bezos moving to Miami, and he's yeah. bringing forty thousand employees with fifty thousand or fifty thousand. FIFA um, <laughs> just took forty thousand square feet of office space in Coral Gables. They're they're bringing like their legal team over. We are getting some World Cup games in Miami in twenty twenty six. We're going to get ten games, but uh, it's not a temporary office. So you know, Ken Griffin with Citadel. These guys that that come here now, think about it. If you do business with Citadel, a lot of business. You need to be close to Citadel. So, like, you know, it's like the planets come and then all the the moons come and then the little satellites come. (laughs) Right. And so it's like, listen, it's not going to get cheaper in South Florida. Now, you may pay a little less in interest if you wait, but you're going to pay a little more in price. Yeah. So, you know, it's just it's just what do you want to pay? I got two people now that that are moving in from out of state. I got two friends of mine that are moving in. One's from Maryland uh, and one's from Ohio. Right. Um, Dude, like. It's 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 interesting to see what how they see Miami, right? It's mm-hmm. interesting to see what you know, like and 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 again, and and when I tell them when they ask me, well, what do you think is gonna happen with Miami? I'm like, why are you if, if you, why are you here? Yeah, exactly. Right? Well, imagine that there's other a lot of other people just like you, and then add Colombia, add Chile, add you know whatever country's having a fucking issue at that particular moment, yep. right? Coming in here. And that's the issue. That's yeah, Miami. Venezuela. So we, Venezuela. One, we, although we are they're, one revolution they are now away unwelcome. from a, from a yeah, right. They're, they're <laughs> unwelcome. Now. But but it's 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 man. It's a weird place. We're in a weird situation right now. That's hard to understand to somebody that's not from here. You know. Well, I think the pet point you bring up. We are always one revolution away yeah. from a real estate boom in Florida. Right. But the other piece of this is because people always really want to know where is this going. Right. right. We are right now experiencing the market that is driven by the rates having peaked where they were. Article just came out maybe two days ago that mortgage applications have spiked way, way up because rates have dropped a little bit. And so this is the thing, because I fly all over the country, so I talk to real estate agents all over the U.S. They're all in the same place where there's insufficient inventory to match the current ready, willing, and able buyers that we have. So if you just see right now where we are, you say, hey, this is the market based upon interest rates being close to eight that people are paying. And now rates have fallen. So the prices were being supported with rates at eight. If rates fall, what are you going to anticipate is going to happen? Well, that's what I'm telling these guys. I'm like, like, you know, one one particular friend of mine that's moving in from from Ohio – they're, they're, they they mention well you know our rates you know, rates are going to drop and this and that I'm like do you know what happens in Miami when rates drop <laughs> do you do you have any idea what happens in Miami you'll be paying fifty a hundred thousand dollars over appraised value for the same fucking house sure same fucking house you know so it's 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 uh I don't know if that happens everywhere else I, I mean I'm I'm sure it's a, it's a, it's it's part of you know the, the whole not being enough inventory and the whole situation but at the end of the day. We're having serious inventory issues right here. And by the way, like when, when, you know, so these people are like, all right, well, do I go, you know, they have the ability to go, you know, all the way to one point something million, this and that, or, you know, you know, we, we, they talked about starter, like, Hey, what's the low in this area here? What's the lowest we can do? Fucking 700. Yep. You know, for, for, and by the way, th- this particular people are coming from a fucking hundred acre farm. Yeah. We're going to get some shit in the comments about that. They're like, do you what? hear these fucking assholes? A million dollar house, a $700,000 house. Yeah. It's like, hey, man. But it's, it's, the fuck but, but, but it's Miami. Is low compared the to New York and, and yeah. San Francisco. It's Miami. Right? It's like, what do you want me to tell you? Yeah. It's I mean, Miami. I mean, we'll get to work. Well, I mean, look, right. the price, yeah. the prices <laughs> well, are 
based upon no all listen all desirable markets are expensive undesirability I mean, right? I mean it's, it's, it's like more San Francisco believe I, I know I know you think it's a disaster and there's piss everywhere we and think? fucking there's a Dude, there's a lot of still a lot of nice places in San Francisco. I mean, like, let's be real, bro. You don't get off the plane and you're a war zone. But I mean, but, come but, on. Bro. I, what, I, I mean, mean, listen. Okay, neither one of us have been there recently, but I've had several people that I know there were from yeah. there, including uh, Uncle Leon. You right. Should, well, listen, you got your computer. Check for some prices and houses right now. No, absolutely. But don't, let's not. Let's not. Come on. Well, what I, I'm we're, saying we're is, we're trying not to get political, and I get it. I mean, we're even trying not to argue. <laughs> but when you start fucking saying that there's not shit in the streets in San Francisco, I, when I've seen, what I'm like, saying is, I said it's not like you get out of the fucking plane and it's a war zone, bro. Like it's not just not zone. quite as bad as it's as it's made out to San be. San Francisco has been and, weird, and though. yet yeah. what I'm saying is the it's expensive. So it's like every place that people want to be is yep. expensive. You want to know why? Because people want to be there. I mean, it's yeah. not a complicated concept. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it's you know, the same it's, thing. It's it, like what people New York me. is a fucking piece of shit. I get it. Try to buy a fucking place in Manhattan. Okay. You think it's pricey here? Try Absolutely. to buy it in Manhattan. Okay. No, I mean, it's like people you know? say to me, you, can you, you see what I can get in a pokey Florida? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, but you're in a pokey Florida. Right, right. Like, but you got to live in a pokey Florida. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's like, so, I get it. Know, I get um, it. And, but that's what, you know, again, that's what people don't, don't understand. It's, it's, um, it is a market it's, it's, decision. So, so let me and tell you what buyer. Let me tell you what demand, baby. The, the prices are where the prices are because someone has been willing to pay. It. I always love these people. I get it all the time that act like, oh, rents are unaffordable. I'm like, well, how the hell do you think the rents got there? Somebody yeah. agreed to pay that. Yeah. Like, if nobody agrees to pay the yeah. rent, it, the price can't go up. It's funny. How is it's it hard to understand. Our conversations kind of always lead us back to the same place. Like, the people that complain about rent prices, but they, they think they like capitalism, <laughs> they're like, somebody's got to stop this. Somebody's got to do something. Somebody's got to Somebody's got to just control. These, these uh, landlords are out of control. I'm like, hmm, that sounds good. Yeah. That sounds very uh, capitalistic. Let, let, me, let me tell you, man. <laughs> crushes my soul. Let me, let me tell you. Crushes let me tell my soul. You. So, so, I was talking to um, Talking to our lenders yesterday, right? Um, we're in an interesting situation, right? So credit card debt is the highest it's ever been recorded yep. in the history of our country. Uh, late payments on cars are the highest, which, by the way, I saw the number. It was the highest. It was 9.1% or something like that, which I saw pretty fucking low. I thought, it, I thought when they said the highest ever, it was like yeah, yeah, 30%. It's... I mean, not... Less than ten percent of people are paying their yeah, cards. Remember like, the source, bro. I got it. You know what? What, do you, what source? Whatever source is giving you the statistic and what their objective. Oh, is. you mean like do the, they the want to make that, they, uh, they the, want to make it seem like, like emo, it's the, the end of the fucking no, but, no, but, it, but it still is the highest you number know? wise. It is. It is still the highest, right? But also, okay. So again, just, just talking, you know, talking with bankers and lenders yesterday it was I, I had several of these conversations yesterday, right? So if debt is up, late payments are up. Are, are, are considerably and equity in homes is the highest it's ever been in the history of our country. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen coming up? And by the way, spending, right? Uh, 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 Thanksgiving spending was up uh, there. There are other, you said that article that retailers yeah. are expecting it to be off the fucking charts. Right? So people are continuing to rack up their credit cards, right? It could be the highest ever and they're going to continue to do it. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant. I'm hesitant to go there. With retail sales, I, I, because I, October was such a bad retail month, I think that what people were doing was waiting for this, the the Black Friday type sales, and they're predicating what their anticipated sales are on what they saw in the early part of the Christmas season. I, I think that would be one to kind of wait and see. Uh, you know, like I'm not normally a big wait and see guy, but but on this, because of all the reasons that you're saying, it, it seems like there's got to be fallout. And I don't think the fallout is going to be people listing their homes. I no, no. That's what I was gonna, it's going to be HELOCs. Yeah, it's going to be HELOCs. I think HELOCs are going to, and I'm, that's what I'm prepping myself for, for a fuckload of HELOCs coming up next. next. And, and as yesterday I was talking about it. I had meetings based on it and everything. I get here, I get here this morning. Can we was, translate that for, for like home, every... Home equity lines of credits? Yeah. yeah. So let me get this point across. So I get here today and, and I... I, I you know, eight thirty in the morning, whatever. I, I I go to Janelle's desk, and and she's like, uh, she's like, oh look, this so so and so is is agent of ours is, is getting a HELOC and, and, and buying an investment property mm -hmm. with with the with their equity. Like first conversation I had, right? So, um, so yeah, HELOCs are you know it's basically a second mortgage that's like a credit card. I mean, that's the best way, the simplest way I could explain. A, a first or second mortgage, depending on. Well, yeah, but in this market, it's going to be second mortgage. 
it, 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 with the caveat that the bank is usually going to make you take out the principal balance right away up front and keep the money out for a period of time and charge you interest on it. But once you pay that money back, you can take and then use it. I wish forward. I wish one of our lenders was here who's shall remain nameless. Yeah. Remember the other day he tried to bust my balls with, uh, yeah. you're yeah. not supposed to use your HELOC yeah. to like go on yeah. vacation. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I'm like, yeah. he's like, well, you can put on the application that you're going to use it for vacation. I'm like, yeah. How many HELOC applications have you submitted with that as the fucking use of funds, bro? Well, God yeah. bless, man. So, God, so but people. the reason why I'm calling it a second mortgage, right, is because... In this market, so again, so well, it operates add, as a second mortgage. It is, but no, no, but let's add another factor to this, right? You don't have to be a fucking brain surgeon or, or a genius to figure out what's going to happen this coming year, right? People are not going to want to refi out of their 3%, 2.5%, you know? Mm -hmm. They're not going to want to. So right. what's going to happen now is that this is going to give us, people are going to start getting these HELOCs. It's going to give us a little bit of breathing room, you know? And, and people are going to continue to do what they fucking do, which is continue to rack up, you know, their credit cards. They're going to they're gonna max out that, that, that line of credit real quick, okay? The next shoe to drop, I think it's going to be when? I don't know. What, what's, you know, these HELOCs going to buy us time-wise? Probably a year. And then they're going to have to sell. No then they're going to have to either refi or sell. Right? No, probably there will be a bunch of foreclosures. People don't fucking understand. I mean, it's like, first of all, there's no foresight. OK, like very few people look ahead. OK, and and the truth, man. And, and, and listening, you can't blame them because they're living fucking check to check. Yeah. So, you know, that's not you're just trying to figure out, bro, how to go from here to there. You know, it's like so nobody's thinking about the next shoe and this and that. It's just and I agree with your initial point. Um, first of all, I'm just not, the initial I'm, one. No, 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 no. <laughs> Spe <laughs> specifically, though, <laughs> about the predictions and people make predictions and nobody really knows what the fuck they're talking about anymore. So. I've been saying for a couple of years now that with things like um, macroeconomics, like these big outlooks, sure. okay, and it's the same in politics, okay, and political polling and things like that. It's like the old tried and true data points are just less and less reliable because of how fast the world is changing. Sure. So it's like you just can't sit there and it's like, no, the inverted yield curve. Remember, like two years ago, somebody was like, the yield curve is inverted. The You know, the end of the, the world, world is, is near. And it's like, first of all, no one has any fucking clue what the inverted, the inverted yield curve. <laughs> okay, so you're saying that and it's like most they look people at the chart. Like, they look at the chart. Most people are like, what the fuck is this guy talking about, bro? I don't even know. They go out the same day. They buy their fucking chicken. But I'm kitchen. very worried. But I'm right. very worried about it. I don't know what <laughs> right. he's saying. Because so, the headline so, tells me, no, right. because the headline so, tells so, me to be worried. don't get it. And then if you notice, the yield curve was inverted and nothing happened. The economy got stronger for like then. And that was during Trump. Okay. Yeah. The economy got stronger like 16 times over. Mm -hmm. So it's like they just, w what happens is that, that there was a time when change in all, in all aspects of life was far slower. Sure. So the established knowledge, okay, like the science, if you will, was better for longer. Mm -hmm. Okay, better for longer. So it's like, and and what happens is that you can you see this frustration with people and with talking heads on every single point. So it's like now, if you're a scientist or an expert, you're not allowed to be wrong, like even for a second. Like revising your position is evidence that you have no fucking idea yeah, yeah, what you're talking clueless. about. Yeah. It's not about science. It's like, think about it. They used to operate on people and the surgeon didn't wash their hands. Yeah. And fucking people died in fucking droves. Were all those surgeons morons? Because they didn't know that they like now you're thinking, bro, they tell you there's a sign everywhere you go, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. So and you so, wear gloves. So right. So it's like it, you know, back in the day, how many people died because the fucking surgeon didn't wash his hand? The surgery was a success, except for the infection that the guy fucking put in the body. They just wiped right? his ass. Uh, <laughs> right. So 30 you know, seconds ago with no toilet paper, right, by but, the way, but because what, there was no but, toilet paper. Right. But what's incredible is that at that time, like nobody was ever like, oh, these fucking doctors don't know what the fuck they're doing. They didn't, you know, now they wash their hands. It's like, you see that? They were idiots. So it's the same with every single thing now. So, so I'm not a fan of the alienation of expertise, which is what we're seeing. Okay. Like, like nobody likes experts anymore. You're elite and you're a fucking asshole and you went to school. It's like that meme I send you guys all the time where it's like the, the inside of a plane, it's a little photo of like the, the fuselage of the airplane and like there's a, everyone sitting there. 
And this guy stands up and he's like, I'm tired of these smug pilots telling me what to do. Who thinks I should fly the plane? And everyone's like, yeah, you should fly the plane. And it's like, dude, you know, so so there there has to be a balance. Yeah. But I but I agree with what you're saying and about the predictions, because the problem is that these the experts rely well, on the 2008 crash. You go back and oh, this guy predicted that this was going to happen. Well, there's, you know what I mean? Like, well, again, it's it's no, I, and it's I, everybody the, was playing around. You know, the, I think there's two pieces to this, right? Because I I agree with what you're saying, and and that's kind of the pushback. I think the arrogance level of the experts has moved up to eleven, which makes this <laughs> yeah. like when you're wrong, it's like you see, I hate that guy. He's wrong. Yeah. And so you know, and, and I think you in, in in our society, everybody is putting themselves forward as an expert. So to stand out, you have to be uber confident yeah. that what you're saying is you know f handed down from on high on you know yeah. on stone tablets. This is how it is. No, and not just that, but the also the the exagger like the people's exaggerated notion of their own cleverness. Oh yeah, is also at an all time high. Like everyone's a fucking researcher now. I love that. Like, we got a guy, we deal with him every fucking day. He's like, no, I did my research on this. It's like, oh my God, this guy did his fucking research. research you Can you Google. imagine, bro? You like, Google. I went to school for three fucking years, bro, to learn the law, but like, you're going to research it. You know what I mean? I was it's on like, legal Zoom for a good like, solid 15 minutes checking this out. Man. Right? You know what I mean? So it's like, again, again, but listen, lawyers get it wrong all the time. Doctors get no, it wrong all the time. Um, <laughs> no, they do. Ask, remember the shitty NAR lawyers, according to you. Um, yeah. So, well, you know, I mean, it's like, look, it's it's um, it's tough. It's a, it's a balance. But as a as a general premise, things change so fast now that it's very difficult to ha to make solid predictions or to use like the, 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 you know, tried and true metrics to make predictions. You, you have to, you have to, if you're not adding in new variables, you're going to be wrong more often than not. And, okay. And, but, I mean, but, and especially in, a, in an environment where we're in right now, we have a globe, a global recovery, economic recovery from a pandemic that's going on an economy that, that has, has largely switched <laughs> from a, na a national economy <laughs> to a global economy. You know, a butterfly farts in Taiwan, and, and it affects everything. It affects everything yeah. now, and you have this this ripple effect. Yeah, I mean, you know, you have a Chinese real estate yeah. market that's absolutely collapsing. Yeah. What and is you, that? You got people fucking tweeting America first on their Chinese made phone. <laughs> it's fucking amazing, man. It's again, it's it's a it's a it's a weird time. You know, I know we don't we don't like to get into the politics a lot, but it's a uh, you know, I kind of feel like getting into politics a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's just listen. It's it's uh, unfortunately it's on everybody's mind. And when sure. I was a kid, I used to when I in, uh, a kid in college, I remember studying political science, and I realized that in other countries, particularly like South Central American countries, the politics in terms of like their involvement, like their voter turnouts are are usually far higher than ours. Like in the United States, you know, it, almost people, life or death over there. People though. weren't right, <laughs> it, but it's funny you say that because people like at, at, again in college, it wasn't such a thing. Like that you liked politics was like a, a rare character. I ask you that all the time, and I do that. We're just more. Are we the older guys now that, or, yeah. or this is this really well, impacting us more? It's a combination more? of that yeah. we're older, but now if you look at kids, I mean, like kids are much more. Like into politics now, and so like phone. they're more and, they're more into causes. I think yeah, and that's yeah, yeah. Kind of driving well, but but causes now are politics because I mean, yeah. culture war is like the number one political thing in the United States. I mean, and, and by the way, other countries love that. Mm -hmm. Like that part, I agree with all you guys. Like the Russians, the Chinese, all these people, well, they're they, they, the they're, they're they're they are absolutely lapping it up. That we just cannot get our shit together here on anything. That we're have fucking that? worried about fucking the, have the you girls seen that video? wearing or boys wearing fucking yeah. playing golf. Have you seen that video? Have you seen that video of a uh, uh, crow? You know, crows are like the smartest animals. Period. Did you know that? Like just a regular black crow. I mean, they I've, pass. I've, crazy. I've heard they're smart. I don't. No, no, like they're off the charts smartest. So there's a video of two cats on a roof, right? Mm -hmm. And then the bird, the, the cats are like kind of far away from each other. They're like there, whatever. But they're not even in, in a fighting stance or anything like that. They're just fucking there. And the bird comes and pokes one of them, right? The cat gets pissed off, pokes the other cat, right? Dude, and like literally, you got it. This video is just an amazing thing. Like the like he starts poking these cats so they start fighting. 
each other. And then you can see <laughs> that the bird is just the fucking crow is happy. He's flying around <laughs> and he's and he's looking and he stands and he's looking at him fighting. And then they stop fighting. He starts poking him again. So they fight again. I think that's what these guys are doing. I mean, they're oh, looking absolutely. at us and they're poking. They're like, oh shit, this is what. Yeah. This is what's triggering it right now. Yeah, and, and they're and fucking with us through social media. No, and not just that. And I'll tell you what, part of the problem, and, and I, I was just talking to, to you know my boss about it the other day, is um, freedom is a, is a large co contributor to chaos and disarray here. You know, because it's like, so you, see, you say these things, people are like, well, you know, um, we were watching TV and it was like this, this massive you know, pro-Palestinian protest at one of these college campuses, you know, and it's like down with Israel and you see these signs and the signs are very aggressive, you know, and like, so, yeah. you know, and, and there's a lot of anxiety about that issue Thank right you. now. And so, but, but then, you know, and the people often make these comments like, Thank you. you know, they shouldn't allow that, you know, they, they shouldn't allow that on these campuses. They should, they should, they should stop that. That's tricky. Because and it, it's like, it incites and violence. It's like, it incites violence, but if you stop it, you're it's, right. And you're, it's like, okay, so I get it. Well, so we don't like that, but what, I mean, remember the First Amendment? I thought we were into like, you know, the freedom to of assembly and to, you know, it's like an of speech. So it's like, what do you want to do? You can't, you know, it's like you're upset that. Uh, and let me tell you something. It's very problematic for the Democrats right now because there are a lot of Democrat voters that are anti-Israel. And it just gets to the point that these guys are politicians. They got to stay in office. First, you got to get in office, and then you have to stay yeah. in office. Yeah. And listen, a large segment of your constituency, um, you know, um, you. wants you to put some brakes on your support for Israel. Mm -hmm. So what do you do at that point if you're a politician? F figure, figure out which group you don't mind pissing off the most. And, right. And, and, or, and figure out which group you can piss off and survive yeah, and stay in exactly. office. Yeah, that's yeah, really, yeah. That, that's that's really the thing. Point. But let, let me tell you something. So uh, you guys know, my, my friends, you guys know I'm like as pro-Jew as can possibly imagine, right? Like I have my, my fascination and admiration. You should use the word Israel. No, no, I'm going to oh. go to that. I'm going to yeah. go to that. So just Jews as a whole, just, just what they've been able to accomplish. I mean, I think that nobody's gotten their asses kicked more than the Jews. I mean, it's arguably, you know, I mean, there's, there's no uh, sector in society that's gotten their ass kicked. And those guys are the most successful by far. Okay, that's, that's the way I feel about that. And but minister, I also and yeah. minister maintain their culture through, well, while having no no and a culture no, of no, hard no work, homeland frugal, like that they're for, frugal. For of years. They get made fun of that all the time, you know. But just education and great stick investors, together, yeah. great investors. I think that's stereotyping. I think that's hundred percent of this. You gotta be careful because you start stereotyping, you get God in trouble. Bless, bro. But um, but, but that's the truth though. Now now we don't give a fuck. But yes or no, you gotta toe that line. Sometimes you yeah. can't say you know you can't say uh, uh, Chinese people are good at math, right? Yeah. You can't. You can't say that, right? Great gamblers. <laughs> Are they, they really? Love, they love to gamble. Because they're good at math. They love to gamble in right? China. Because they're good at math. Oh, my God. So um, my point is, but, but I also using have... the word they is bad. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Like sometimes if saying they, them, you're like the best. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, they, them, yes. Hey, you're so sensible. Thank you for using my pronouns. They, and when them. you're like they referring to a group of people, they're like, oh, my God, this guy's a fucking rave. What do you let, mean let, they, bro? Let, let's, uh, let's, let's clean it up then and say statistically a greater share of their population Listen, so, tends to favor uh, games of chance. So here's what I, so then, I don't know if you guys have seen the videos, okay, of – these Hamas guys. Have you guys seen the raw, edited, unedited videos of these guys going into the houses and killing shit people and everything? Well, you should. I mean, it's. I've it, seen a few. It's pretty horrific. I mean, it's they're going in there and they're just straight up, just just sh just randomly shooting people with machine guns. Just, I mean, like if they were not human. I mean, it, that's the best way I could describe mm -hmm. it. They're just going through it. Like I would have a hard time shooting a stuffed teddy bear. How like about that. the one where they shot the dog? You saw that? Yeah, the dog's fucking, I sent you that one. I yeah. fucking pissed me off. I mean, I know that humans matter more than dogs, but I don't know. To me, you know, I have a you know, I, I for whatever yeah. reason, I don't know if this makes me a psycho or whatever, but I see a human getting shot and I see a dog getting shot. A dog getting shot will fuck my day up. Yeah, like it I will change my mood permanently. For the entire day. It depends on the human. A kid getting shot. Is, okay. Well, yeah. okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Okay. So the, uh, the, an adult. I meant an adult. Yeah. An adult. Uh, dog. Dogs tend to be innocent, and you know. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. So maybe innocent. that's what it is. The, the innocence. Kids, the innocence yes. the is innocence. the part that triggers it, right? So, um, so again, dude, saw that, and it's crazy. But I have a couple very good, like, it, like decent Muslim, Palestinian, you know, type friends and everything like that, you know, through through sport, you know that that uh they kind of told me their side of the story right and i'm very you know i, I try man you know it, it's almost like 
if you hear their side of the story, mm -hmm. right? Like this has been going on. I mean, one of them has told me, you know, I had a funny conversation with one of them, you know, because he's like, yeah, you know, it's just a real sector of the population that there's really, really small sector of bad Jews and a really, really small sector of bad Muslims. And those crazy, basically those crazy motherfuckers are the ones that cause the issues for, for, every, for everybody else. Sure. You know, we talked about like, he's like, we talked about the, like Allah Akbar, right? When you guys hear Allah Akbar, whatever, when yeah. you hear that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you think? Yeah, death to America. It really means praise God or something yeah, like that. God is yeah. great, I think. Yeah, right. God is great. Something right. Like and I'm like, and again, this is a super good guy. I mean, we went, you know, I mean, it's a friend of mine. Like, I have, you know, and 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 I've had a lot of actually Muslim friends and they're generally really good people. Yeah, yeah. You know, you got, but but I told them, I go, yeah, buddy, but here's the fucking problem. Your crazy people are really crazy. Right? Like, okay, so like Cubans have, a, a, our, our crazy people just, they commit Medicare fraud. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, they wear funny. They wear funny fucking pants, right? Yeah. And, and, you know yeah, what I mean? Way they, too much jewelry. They wear way too much jewelry. Funny ass haircuts, yeah. okay? And they commit their geniuses at, at Medicare fraud. Yeah, they're not fraud blowing in up. general. They're not blowing <laughs> fraud in general. They're not blowing up, you know, innocent people in a fucking build. And I go, listen, you know, let's talk about the term Allah Akbar, right? If I'm in a plane, okay, and the guy next to me is praying <laughs> okay and just so happens to use to, to, to verbalize Allah hey, Akbar dun, dun, dun. listen and it just Danger so happens zone. whatever whatever we won't need an air what, no whatever <laughs> listen if if I am sitting oh, there and all of a sudden God. my name my neighbor starts verbalizing Allah Akbar that guy's getting his fucking ass kicked Okay, because I am going to think, you know what my buddy said? He goes, yeah, me too. <laughs> you know I mean? He's like, because, yeah, because what are you used to seeing? You're used to seeing somebody getting their head chopped off. Allah Akbar. Uh, yeah. Things blowing up. Uh, you know what I mean? So it's like yeah. one of those things that like, uh, so back to the Israel and Palestine thing. Dude, that shit's been going on so long. No, yeah. listen, I'll tell you what. Great movie. So great long. movie. Kingdom of Heaven. Mm -hmm. yeah great movie man ed norton is you know the the king of jerusalem at the, the he plays the king of jerusalem at the time during this period right after one of the crusades where um jerusalem was actually open to everyone to all faiths mm -hmm. and um you know obviously there was a there there was some battles because there a new king came that he was actually a leper king okay so the guy had leprosy and oh, he sure. had like a mask and um he died young oh, mission and the next king wasn't so friendly, you know, this, the, the, you know, Christianity was in charge at that time and um, he wasn't so friendly to everybody else. And then there was a major war and the city was lost again. And that prompted yet another crusade. And and so, you know, this goes back thousands of years. It's true. But but what what this whole point reminds me of and if you guys might have seen it recently, you saw how like three weeks ago or something like that. I forget what the name of the publication was, but it's a, a well-known publication and they they published again Osama bin Laden's letter to America, okay, which was, oh, yes, 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 which yes. came out like shortly after 9-11 yeah. and this and that. And it was like why we attacked and the whole thing. And yeah. so, and then all these kids in the country, like hundreds of thousands of Americans, read the letter, and then they come out on TikTok and they're doing these videos, and they were like, you know, there's one girl, I remember the video was like her, she's like, it's the caption is me, you know, 15 years ago or whenever when Obama announced that we killed Osama bin Laden, you see her, she's jumping up and down. And then he, she's like, me after reading, you know, Osama bin Laden's yeah. letter to America. And she's like, oh, my God, we deserved it. And blah, blah, blah. blah. And I understand oh why. And, and by yeah. the way, hundreds of thousands yeah. of Americans yeah. had this sentiment to the point that the publication took the letter down and then you couldn't find it anymore and the whole thing. And, and here's what happens. OK. If you sit here as an american and you suggest that america has never done anything Sheep. bad no way. to right. the rest of the world no. we're you, motherfuckers you are a we're fucking liar we're motherfuckers okay? now if you have the balls to be here in america enjoying what america yeah. has provided for or americans then listen, it's really hard to fucking criticize. Like again, like you know, you're in your SUV while you bitch about fucking global warming. I mean, these things just don't make sense. And there's a movie that 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 conceptualizes this concept, encapsulated in one sentence, and it's A Few Good Men with Tom Cruise yep, and yep. and um, uh, 
fuck, what's his name now? The general, Colonel Jessup oh, and um, um, Jack, Nicholson. Jack Nicholson. And um, when Jack Nicholson is on the stand, you know, he they finally they, they, get they start him pissing to, him off. Yeah, yeah, and they get him to he, he they get him to say something he's not supposed to say. And yeah. I remember that he looks around the courtroom and he says, "You fucking people! Yeah, you, don't you have no, no idea, idea what it takes to defend a nation." Yeah. Okay, and and here, and man. as a kid, I remember I watched that movie. I was like thirteen or fourteen years old when it came out. I saw it in the movie theater. I never forget. I was with my parents and we went to Mall the Americas. Okay, your dad took and I saw it. Yes, bro. And I saw <laughs> that movie. And I always wanted to be a lawyer. After seeing that movie, I was certain that's what I was going to be. OK. And um, I remember that that line and I've never, ever forgotten it because it's like, you know what? For us to live the way we live, have no we have to fucking kick ass and take names all over the world. We have to fucking trample on people all over the world. We have to do the things we do. And it's like, listen, well, we're not what dealing the fuck with, do you want me to tell you? And by the way, if we stop, someone else is going to start doing it. We're not it. dealing with normal people either. We're dealing with crazy no, people. No, 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 we got to out crazy the crazy yeah, yeah, to and, keep what we have. Yeah, and, and it's like and it's like people fucking, they don't understand. It's like yeah. you you hear these, these kids now and they're like, no, because the U.S. and this and that. It's like, listen, let me explain something to you, okay? If you show up, to one of these countries that you think we oppress, okay. and you show up with your bullshit, you are the first one on the fucking. Well, how about the, block, the, the 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 LBGQ uh, whatever? Yeah, um, that, that are pro a Palestine. Yeah, 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 that are. Yeah. Bro, you would be <laughs> thrown Stoned, from bro. a building. You know what they do to gay people in those? They th they blindfold you because they think it's funny to blindfold you before they throw you off a building. Why do you need to, why do you need to add the blindfold? Just to be an extra so they, dick. You I mean, go, there's no other no, reason, right? right? So, <laughs> so that you go from like the, the, the G-force <laughs> right, butterflies to right, sudden right, impact without knowing, bro, without when, it's knowing when it's I mean, coming. It's only, yeah. Listen, it's fucking crazy. I'm I, telling I'm, you. I'm going to toss this one because you kind of alluded to it, but I, I really think it's, it's important. One, by, by the way, I saw that movie with my father as well. Colonel Jessup was his favorite character, and he hated. Yeah, he's Tom the man. Cruise. He's the freaking man. The you know, man. Like, that 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 Jessup was this evil guy. My father went to military school. The bag of oranges in the middle of the night that happens. Right? Yeah, you, you don't screw up because then everybody they, they take care of it amongst right. themselves. Right, That's a thing. But <laughs> this is the, this is the question. My, my brother always said that a lot of the the ivory tower thinking is good first order thinking. We should redistribute all the wealth. Okay, what happens the day after that? Mm -hmm. Nobody has a reason to go to work. Everything stops. Nobody owns anything. You know, like it all comes toppling down, but it sounds great on paper. Okay, so the U.S. is not the one. Who else do you trust to take and, and right. be like, I mean, I would say looking globally at what we've done as a country, I don't think anybody else after World War II gives everything back. I mean, God knows the Nazis it's like, wouldn't. Have. It's like, by the way, I was joking about the whole thing, picking, you know, the same thing, the conversation with the the, the, the protest and the, this and that. We were driving back from Boca and uh, and we're talking about, you know, Gaza. And, and we're like, yeah, you know, and, and he, somebody was asking in the car, they, what is it? What's meant by this concept of the open air prison? Like when you hear that Israel keeps all these people in an open air prison, what's that mean? And, and I was like, well, what it means is that it's a very small little fucking area that's that's complete fucking trash it's like the poorest i think it's like the poorest place per capita in the world many times over imagine it's five by it's five miles wide by like 20 miles long and there's two million people in there mm. okay and so it's in and they control the water coming in they control the power they control the fuel the feud the you know the food the fuel everything and so and you can't leave so that's what's meant by this this open air prison. And then, you know, and then this other guy in the car who's a, a very smart and he's a cynic and he's like, well, we should probably start looking at real estate there because we're about to spend billions of dollars to rebuild it. <laughs> so it's going to be fucking great now. You know, it's like yeah. now it's going to be high rises and fucking because that's what the United States does. We fucking Iraq. bomb shit. And, and then we and go it, in there and rebuild it. it. Yeah. You know, and it's like, so it's like, got, you know, if the Americans are attack, attacking you, it's like, I got good news and I got bad news. The it's bad news is for a while. The Americans are attacking if you. Can That's the, the bad storm, news. If you can okay? weather the storm. The good news is if you make it, you're going to get all new shit, right. you know? And so it's, it's again, but, but this notion and it, it really bothers me, man. Like the kids, the youth, this anti-American sentiment that people have while they're in America mm -hmm. drives me 
fucking bananas. And there's a difference between wanting your country to be better and improvement for the country. And like, of course, that's all good. But man, this shit that you were like actively anti-American, you know, and like, you know, people like there was a petition recently to change the American flag. Yeah. Literally, like there was a, a, a yeah, what, famous what, what, artist what group, too. What sector was that? Uh, it's a wide variety of, I would say, left leaning. It's it's the Definitely left leaning. It's the left leaning sure. sector. Well, I, I mean, it, it just and this is this is the piece that that always troubles me. The thing that used to unite us was our love of this thing that we had here. Like, hey, look, we might politically disagree, but this thing we got going on here is so much better than what we could do anyplace else. Let's figure out how to bridge the gap. The position that, that especially in college that I was exposed to, was kind of this, we're a morally wretched com- country mm-hmm. that is completely irredeemable. And I think when you start from, from that place, it breaks down any hope of a narrative between the other side because the, the people that appreciate what we have here, they don't want to hear that crap. I mean, I, I, right. I, I don't want to I don't want to hear that my relatives fought, died, did not come back from wars. And you think that everything that we did, I mean, exactly who would you which, pick the country that's the moral yeah. superior? No, no. And not just that. But how about it's like also the, the obvious things that people don't ever take note of, which is it's like you're here and you complain about how it is in the United States. And yet I don't see, and, and maybe it's our media, okay? Maybe it's the media, the control, or we only they only show us what they want, all this bullshit that you hear. But it's like, are there any other countries with, like, millions of people trying to, like, cross the border constantly? Right. Yeah. Wh- like, are there... Fu- I well, mean, that's what I tell your boy. Wait, that's I mean, what I tell your lefty boy. I'm like, like hey, why, why like, is it so good? It's like, if I just don't understand. Why are people fucking dying, risking Literally. their lives, bro? Hey, alligator-infested waters paying these people called coyotes that rape them and yeah. f- beat their ass on the way here. Why yeah. are they doing that? Yeah. To get, is there any other country that has the fucking waiting list and the, and the fence jumping <laughs> that my, we do? I my, mean, my, I don't get bro- it. My brother put it perfectly. He said to me one time, my, my explanation to people that want to talk about socialism, he said there's a raft halfway between Cuba and Florida. Which way are they paddling? Right. <laughs> right. It's, it's, right. It's just fucking crazy. By the way, me. your brother's the only right-leaning uh, professor that, that I think I know. Well... There, there is a small cadre that exists, but they have been cowed. He's a professor science. in what? Theology, Th- philosophy, philosophy. But by the way, I mean, that's. But so let's talk about that because that's another thing. So the other now, let's let's let me do my my best to chastise the other side as well. Okay. The problem is all these new conservatives that we have, all these new super right wingers. They're also very short on history. Yep. So it's like. People have no fucking clue how much of this we've seen before. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it's like, and, and there's even a cliche for it. It's like, if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it. Yep. Okay. And it's like, so there's a great book. The book is called The Dante Club. Okay. Mm-hmm. By the way, the book is not about politics. You read it I haven't. It's a great book. The Dante Club. The author is a guy named Matthew Pearl. Okay. And what this guy, Matthew, Jewish guy. <laughs> yeah. What this guy, Matthew Pearl, does is he'll take historical events that are somehow unresolved, okay? And then he'll he'll write a book that's based largely on the historical events and then he'll weave in his fiction. Like he'll he'll tie off the story. Also like and, Robert Gay was with Michael like, Claudius. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. Cool. So very cool writing style. Love and it. this book is called The Dante Club. And it's, by the way, the book is not at all political, but there's this undertone in the book that's fascinating, which is that what, what happens in The Dante Club is that in real life, in history, uh, Dante's Inferno, the book, was was written in Italian. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now you have all these publishing houses, you have all this shit, and you have Google Translate, right? And you can bring it up in whatever language you want. But at the time, that's not the way it worked. At the time, you needed what? scholars, and this is like in the 1800s when this is happening, when the when the Dante Club takes place, you needed these scholars to translate, translate all the books books into English, for example. Okay, and the United States being largely Protestant and controlled by Protestants, like there's only been one Catholic president, they right? Translated what John, they wanted to translate. John F. Kennedy. Well, the filter they, they was didn't, they didn't want to translate Dante's Inferno because it was too Catholic. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there were these these uh, group of famous American poets and, and scholars, one of them being Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, that was part of the small group of university professors. Um, and it was in like Massachusetts area, Harvard, Cambridge, Yale, these these places that 
um, translated Dante's Inferno, and and that and they called themselves the Dante Club. Mm. Okay, and so they would meet once a week to go through the translation. Now, here's the fascinating part about the the book: they were catching a lot of heat in real life for doing that because, again, the Protestant authorities didn't really want Dante's Inferno to be translated into English. So in the book, all of a sudden, what, what starts happening is that there start to be these murders in Boston. And, and the bodies would be positioned so that they would be found and, and in these horrible, horrible depictions. Mm -hmm. Okay, And the first murder is of a judge. Okay, and this judge gets murdered, and the way his his body is placed, and the whole thing, the uh, the investigating authorities, the police, and the detectives, they were horrified. Mm -hmm. They they didn't know what to make of it. They they knew it was a serial killer, so the book's about a serial killer. But all of a sudden, Longfellow and the guys in the Dante Club, they realize what's going on. These bodies are being the set position. up in a way that represents each one of Dante's circles of hell. Yep. So what it meant is that the killer has read Dante's Inferno. Now, why were they interested in that? Because they felt they were going to be accused. Sure. Because they were among the very few people <laughs> that, had, that read. had read Dante's Inferno, and in fact, they were actively translating it. So they launched their own hunt for the serial killer. So like there's a detective and the cop. So the book shifts between the detectives and the way the, the law enforcement is trying to find the killer and versus how these professors were trying to find the killer. OK, these these poets based on their knowledge of the book. Fascinating book. But the reason why I bring it up is because universities have long, long been a place that is left leaning. Universities and professors historically going back thousands, you know, as, as long as why? universities have why. been around. It, it's, it's a fairly risk averse uh, type of occupation. It tends to attract people that are smart, but don't necessarily have the risk profile to go out into the. the, the no, so instead of having a ball to no, be an attorney, no, you're going to teach attorney. But he's asking why they're typically left leaning. Yeah, he, I mean, he, he did. And, 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 and I would say that the smart, no, but that is the answer. You're a smart person that is the answer. and you're kind of risk averse. So, Richard, yeah. for most, example, your, your case, you're an attorney. Yeah. Right? You had the balls to go out and actually be an attorney. Right? Yeah. The, the, the attorney professor, the, the law professor that never went on to the field, right? There's a bunch of those, right? Many. Right. That's the risk. That's he's, he's answering. He's that. That's the risk. Yeah, but averse. That, I, it, I don't see why that in and of itself would make those well, because, risk averse people more left leaning. Oh, I, I think. It. I no, think what happens the, is a lot of the, the left leaning politics typically is very protective. We've got to look after. We need social security. Right. All of these right. things that are kind of like I'm like, hey, don't give me fucking social security. They're, they're, I'll they're, invest they're myself. Ba they're based in in more nice cities. They're the government I, I, I worker. They're the government worker. I, I think it's just, it's it's a more risk averse view of life. Like I want greater certainty and I'd like the government to provide that for me as opposed to kind of the, I'll provide my own certainty. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think that's where the break. And I'll tell you what, most trial lawyers, believe it or not, it's a known fact. Most litigators are also left leaning. Yep. Really? Yes. yes. And, and here's why. Because well, that, that, that fucks your theory. No, up. yeah. No, it's, no it, and, it doesn't. And, and uh, it I'll does. It, well, that's what I'm saying. I, I think it's part of what Cadillac's saying. And then I think part of it also is like the amount of education. Because again, it's, it's, here's a good, here's a good example of it. And I was explaining it, same thing in the car when we were coming back and talking about the problem with rights. Okay. The problem with rights, it's responsibility, which, which, yeah. which you don't often hear is that look, so, the Constitution, the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, protects the American citizens from what? Unlawful searches and seizure yeah. and like, you know, the, the torture and things of that nature. Okay? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Okay. If you're driving down the road and you have 10 pounds of cocaine in your trunk and you get pulled over. Cocaine okay, is usually measured in kilos. In kilos. Yeah, thank you. That's who's his knowledge of cocaine is superior to mine. So you got you got ten kilos of cocaine in the trunk. Officer pulls you over. If the cop has, and by the way, then there's a bunch of rules in criminal procedure and in criminal law. It's called a Terry stop. Is the case that it was the case called Terry, and there's a Terry stop, and there's all this criteria that the officer has to go through. To first detect a problem, ask certain questions, et cetera, to then 
be able to lawfully prefer, perform a search of the vehicle. Mm-hmm. Okay, and what do I mean by lawfully? I mean, he can't just decide, get out of the fucking car, I'm searching look. just yeah. because he's looking at you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the profiling concept that we often talk about, you can't do that. Okay, so so you, you can't just look at the guy and say, oh, I think, looks you, like I think you're probably you, a drug dealer, so I'm going to search you. Yeah. Okay, and what happens is that if you if you violate these these rules, okay, such that you then performed an unreasonable search and seizure, when you find the 10 kilos of cocaine, okay, the guy gets arrested. What's the famous uh, police officer phrase? You can beat the rap, but you can't beat the ride. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're getting arrested. When your criminal defense lawyer gets hired and you take that case, he's going to file a motion to suppress the presentation of the evidence of, of the, the cocaine. Yeah. And guess what? He is going to win that motion to suppress. In our example, we've assumed that the search was unlawful. unlawful yeah. And this concept that you don't get to present, the, that, that the prosecution is now barred from coming into court and saying, hey, we're charging this guy with possession of cocaine, and here's the cocaine we found on him. Mm-hmm. Okay? Your inability to present that, that doctrine is called... Even if there is cocaine. 100%. In, in fact, especially, if and here's my point, it's yeah. especially because there's cocaine. This concept, this doctrine is called fruit of the, the poisonous, poisonous tree. tree. Okay? Just like yep. the religious thing, or you, know, you ate the fucking apple. Okay. And so, but here's what people don't understand. People that don't go to law school, they're upset with this shit. Okay. They hear that and they're like, criminals get off on technicalities, you know, because it's like they, they want, they, people don't understand until you go through the training in school, you're like, but they found the cocaine. Like, yeah. what the fuck do you mean? We don't get to prosecute like the guy like this. Does he even get have the, it? So if I got it, I'm right. 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 Like, does he get the cocaine back? And it's like, <laughs> no, he doesn't get the cocaine back. But so there is but, that. But right. But but he's not going to jail for possession of cocaine because guess what? The prosecution is presented from presenting the cocaine. Now, now, why does this matter? Now, again, let's go back to the average, the layman citizen who's upset that criminals get off on these technicalities. And here's what I tell people all the time. Justice Scalia, Antonin Scalia, one of the most conservative justices ever. Yep. OK, he's got a very famous opinion out there where where he says something to the extent of it is only by preserving the rights of these people that commit these crimes, that law-abiding citizens' rights are protected. protected. Because here's what happens. If you are driving now, let's take the same example. You're driving down the street and you look like a drug dealer, whatever the fuck that means. I don't know what it means. But you look like a drug dealer and the cop pulls you over. And guess what? You're not a drug dealer. You're a fucking saint. And the cop takes you out of the car, slams you on the hood, it turns all your car to bring the fucking dog, all your shit's on the side of the road, you're embarrassed. This happens in your neighborhood. Your neighbor Susan's like this. She's driving by and she's like, oh my God, no, look no. at Richard. With the cell right? phone. She's, right, she's the whole thing. Right Now you got video. a cell phone. This and that. Yeah. Guess what? Guess what? Because you have no nothing to, to be arrested for, you have no remedy. Like, you have no remedy. Like, what are you going to do? Sue the police for unreasonable search and seizure? You can't do that. They have sovereign immunity. You you can't sue a cop for searching you like that. And by the way, people and say so, that all the time to the police, which right. is the funniest and thing. So, I'm going to so, sue you. I'm yeah, gonna sue and so you. what happens is, what happens is, we have to, if we don't, like, make sure that rights are protected, even in a case where, like, the cocaine is there, then you don't have rights, bro. You get it? So it's like, so so when you go to law school... All of a sudden, if if you walked into law school thinking, man, if I find you with cocaine, you should be, you know, like, obviously you got to go to jail. What Then you go through criminal procedure and you go through evidence and you realize why it is. And you're like, oh, the constitutional protection. Fuck, that's pretty important. And it's especially important for people that are not driving around with cocaine, because this is what incentivizes police officers to do the right thing. Yep. They're incentivized to do the right thing because they know that if they do the wrong thing, then criminals get away. Yep. You follow? And so, you know, that's why I think in, in general, why do education, why does the why does more education coincide with more liberalism or left-leaning thinking is because 
man, you're given like again, you're given the understanding of why things are the way they are. Like but if you're not if you're it, not educated, you know, you're just out there, bro. I, I it's know, but all wouldn't that, but wouldn't I, that make it where that? Okay, so if the more educated person leans that way because they are more educated, wouldn't that almost make it the right way? Like the more educated way, make it the right way. So, and that's not the case because that, well, in that case, no, socialism because, because socialism has been proven to fail time and time well, again. So, so let's let's so talk, that's yeah, tricky. So let's talk about that for a minute because this is where I think Cadillac makes the great point, which is the problem is that there is a difference between in in life. Okay, it's part of in my view God's irony. There's a difference between theory and practice. Yep. Okay, and so what happens is that in theory. A lot of these things are sound great. They're great concepts that everybody should have enough. And listen, a full time job should pay for your right. enough shit and all these things. In practice, it it becomes a little bit more complicated. Okay, now now what I think most let's call it you know super educated socialists would say. By the way, Gal tried everything possible to get out of this interview thing. Any any <laughs> showing up forty five minutes late ain't gonna get you out. <laughs> come, come in here. We're, 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 we we started already, but... Uh, How you doing? Rich part. <laughs> Good to meet you. Josh. The, the, the other white guy in Miami. Yeah. All right, go ahead, finish. <laughs> um, well, we were just talking about why why universities tend to be left-leaning and why they crank out more more left-leaning thinkers than, than otherwise. And so these... Um, answer because they're funded by Soros. And they're funded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I love I love what you're saying, Rich, and I, I think that the the one thing, and this is where history is so important, the founders had such a tremendous fear of government oppression, of being oppressed by government, that everything was set up like if we got to go one way or the other, let's let's set things up so maybe a criminal gets away, so that the government can't overreach, can't oppress the individuals mm -hmm. by taking rights away, and so that 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 makes that makes great sense. I I'll never forget. When I went to get my, my concealed weapon permit years and years ago, it was my favorite classes. You should give these classes, man. It was great. The guy, the whole first part of it was about castle law and the Magna Carta. And the idea that, you know, when people were trying to get this idea of like having rights themselves, the same, well, like the king, they're going to the king, like, well, well, the king's like, all right, well, fine. What kind of rights do you want? Well, look, you know, nobody would ever come in your house and like grab you and take you out. You, that, right. Well, well, my house is kind of my castle. I mean, it's not as big as yours, but like, I'd like Still to have my it. Castle. Like, yeah. Like I'd like to have it. Like that's a place that they can't just come and grab me. Like mm -hmm. they got to get, they got to go through a process. Right. And, and this, this slow movement from, you know, people were just basically chattel almost mm -hmm. that served at the whim of the divine appointed ruler to the place where people had this idea of individual rights has been a long time coming. But with anything, there's a point of diminishing returns. Absolutely. And and I think that's the place where people are, are trying to continue, trying to have a relevance in life, to continue these great battles for equality and all, that has now maybe gone too far. There's 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 no longer any any juice left to squeeze there, or what juice is left isn't gonna be good juice when we do squeeze it. Kind of yeah, thing. no, I don't disagree. And like, and when you say Jesus, uh, you know, socialism has never worked anywhere, and all that. Th that this is these are indisputable facts. What I think, what I think these people would say, okay, is like, for example, Marx, okay, but who's you know widely believed to be the, the father of socialism, right? When when Marx was which was your old dog's name, by the way, Marxy. <laughs> Yeah. So, so when, when, yeah, it had a why though, it was a very important distinction. So, so when you, when, when he was writing, there was already the notion of socialism already existed. He didn't invent it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now he actually hated existing here, there to four existing socialists because he felt that they were what's called utopian socialists, meaning that they had this bullshit view of you know this this paradise where you wake up in the morning and you fucking paint and then in the afternoon you want to fucking play the flute and you know and everyone yeah, yeah. has all these things and then skin flute and, and he had the <laughs> and he had this uh what he felt was this concept called scientific socialism okay which he felt that it was inevitable okay that what happens is that you capitalism could not sustain itself for a variety of reasons and by the way what kind of capitalism was he referring to he was referring to 
Adam Smith's capitalism, pure capitalism, which, by the way, we do not have. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so the notion that we have pure capitalism in this country, people are like, no, we're, we're strictly capitalists. It's like, meanwhile, you got Social Security and you got public school and you got like the United States Post Office. And th these things are not present in Adam Smith's capitalism. And so what happens is- Does anybody is, have anywhere no in the world? One, no one, no one. And in fact, and who do we have to thank for the victory, in my, my opinion, okay, of like why this has been the most successful form of economic governance in the world was a guy named Keynes. OK, yeah. so John Maynard Keynes, a British guy. And so Adam Smith was like the invisible hand. You leave the economy alone. You leave people alone. The invisible hand will, will regulate, you know, the economy and everything will be great. And Marx was like, nope, fuck that. Uh, there's a ruling class. You guys, you control the surplus. You make it impossible. And by the way, that won't happen forever because the workers outnumber you. And the more things become accessible, the less you can control. And, and eventually it's just going to collapse on itself. And Keynes was like, both of these fucking guys are wrong. OK, so Keynes was like, you have to have a, occasional government intervention in the economy to preserve this form of capitalism. It, it doesn't work on its own. So it's more efficient, Keynes would have said, for the government to do things like handle the road building OK, and the road repairing, even if they sub it out and they and we, they have to have like public schools and we have to have these things. And so it's like we have these elements that are contrary to capitalism in capitalism. And, and, and by the way, the term for that was neo-capitalism. OK, is that's what we have. It's a, a version of capitalism that has some of these ingredients in there. So just to answer your question. You know, Marx would, would tell you no communist country is actually communist because they don't have advanced capitalism. Marx believed that you have to have advanced capitalism to, to be able to achieve communism. And that's why the Russians threw an entire generation of people at industrializing. Like, you know, you don't people don't realize what Stalin did. He was fucking horrible. You talk about fucking a terrible guy, bro. That guy threw like a hundred million Russians at turning Russia from an agricultural country to an industrial country in five years. Mm -hmm. He industrialized the country in five by throwing an entire generation at, of Russians at it away. Yeah, he threw them away. Right, because he believed this concept that Marx and Lenin were were were, were promoting that you have to have advanced cap. You can't achieve communism without advanced capitalism. So, and and listen, I don't know if it's true or not, but I'll tell you what. Like, think about it. Cell phone. Okay. When, when they first came out, we all first started walking around with cell phones. What was the price of the fucking cell phone? Yeah. Remember? And making the calls and this and that. Now they give the you brick. the fucking phone. Yeah. Right. right? And, that, and that's the concept that he's saying, that the technology just becomes so, it proliferates to the point that, like, you have to find something else to make money on. But I, I think, I, and 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 the 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 big problem for me always because I am not a. Big By the kid. way, do you want to introduce Gal, man? I yeah, mean, yeah. I, well, fucking I, mean, weird we, I wanted to finish the conversation. Yeah. All right, so let's introduce everybody. We got kind of not start the whole podcast, but we got kind of like a little bit of a reset. So I want to introduce you to, the, to 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 everybody here. Richard, a uh, friend of mine for too long, what almost twenty years now. Yeah, um, yeah I know it's, <laughs> it's been a rough ride. So he knows you well. <laughs> so he's uh, he's uh, an attorney, a real estate attorney, because I I, I basically uh, uh, almost forced him to be a real estate attorney. He was a regular ambulance chaser before, right? Um, he is now technically. Uh, Richard, would you consider yourself the most powerful real estate attorney in Florida? Right no, now? man. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, listen. listen no, man, just man. paint the target. Listen, on your no, back. Bro, listen. No, fuck there, you. There's an no. argument for that. There's, there's an argument. No, for that's that. ridiculous. There's, there's argument for that. Don't be humble now. No, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. If we were outside, you would be like, fuck I, yeah. I, no, man. <laughs> Are you the kidding? microphone's on, Trust so he's humble all of a sudden. We say more than enough, we make more than enough cancelable offenses on this podcast. That that would just be another one. But no. So, uh, my, my partner in the title company, we've done I don't know, thousands and thousands of deals. Uh, Mr. Cadillac is a, a world-renowned uh, real estate <laughs> real estate instructor for the National Association of Realtors. Yeah. Travels all over the country, you know, teaching teaching real estate to fucking places like Wichita, Kansas, and like uh, Montana. Instructor of the year for, Co for Cody, Florida. Wyoming. Instructor of the year, yeah, for, 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 for the Florida for Association of Realtors. Oh, this is his second book, published author. Um, you know me. So so let, let me tell you so so Gal he, That's a hard act to follow, brother. Right? <laughs> You're an awful the greatest player of all time. So 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 Gal he tried everything possible. Even he's really good with his calendar, but today he double booked for whatever reason, right? He was late even to the double booking. Just, just to not do To be that. fair, yeah. Because you sent me the invite in central time. Yeah, I was in Oklahoma when I sent it. So I'll give you that I'll give you half an hour there, but 
But um, so Gal, um, he he is a unique. So we're we're starting. You know, this is like our our our. We're st- we've done some interviews, but we're starting to do interviews a little bit more now. So I, you know, I I love to shit on the excuse makers in in this yeah. in this world, right? As, as you do too. So I I, I you know I, you, we 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 align in, in in almost everything, right? As far as that's concerned, right? Um, so you know. When they see a lot of people, when they see a, a rich person, you know anybody who would see your house in the fucking keys, basically, right, yeah. would would be like, oh, this guy either you know he inherited the money or or he got lucky. And I, I'm, listen, I'm not gonna say that there, there's always luck in business, and there really is. I mean, there's there's but the luck, the harder you work, the the the, 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 the luckier the luckier you get. So, um, you know, gals, an extremely so what what I wanna I, what I wanna get out of this interview, right, is is um what you would consider, you know, and we've talked about a lot of this stuff already, what you would consider the, the, the keys to success, you know, how, how do you become a, from a fucking roofer, yeah. right. To a person worth well over, I could, I could say these numbers a little bit. I, I'm curious what number you're going to say. <laughs> yeah. 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 Over a over, over hundred mil. Let's go. Let's call it. It's, it's, you know, any I, story I, Jesus tells the walk gets a mile yeah. longer. And the yeah. snow yeah. gets a foot yeah. deeper. All right. He's, yeah. he's definitely, version. definitely well over a hundred million. All right. So, um, how do you, how do you get from now? Is, is, did you start off Mexican or you were always white when you started roofing? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I started in masonry, so, yeah, yeah, uh, I think right. Mexican. so how, tell me a little bit about how how you you started. You know, just a, a regular, you know, worker, a roofer. Yes. Yeah, so, well, um, kind of going back even before my professional career, I I think kind is of the microphone the close things, enough to him or no? One of the things that uh, I, I can remember, you know, even in college, which I only went for two years, but. I can remember like waking up in the middle of the night and I had a uh, recorder beside my bed that I would just, you know, and, and I'd be worried about, you know, what am I going to do next? What's, so I've always been this, had this like insatiable appetite to kind of advance. Right. Yeah. Um, e- even today. I, Were you a good student? Um, I was, so I was smart. I got good grades, but I, it's, it's like the adage, right? The A and B students will always work for C and D students. I wasn't a C and D student, but I did as minimal as I possibly could to get, <laughs> to get by, right? an adequate grade. Yeah. Um, and, and to the point, that's actually why I left school. I, I remember I was sitting in a, like a two hundred level English class, um, listening to the guy, um, you know, um, the professor, and I'm like, "This is a waste of my fucking time. I cannot <laughs> sit here for four years. Like, I have to go make money, and there's other right. shit I can do. There's shit happening right now that I need to right. be a part of." Right. Um, <laughs> So I, I think that's one thing for me, right? And, and it's not a requirement to be successful, but I just had this, like, whatever the opposite of complacency is my entire life. Um, um, so I think that's one thing. And then I, I tell people all the time, for me, and, and I think for most, you know, a lot of kids, particularly today, spend, like, the, the 20 to 30-year time frame, you know, hanging out, partying, doing whatever. I didn't. I did that, like, from, like, 14 to 18. Yeah. Um and I was just to the grind all the time at, um, you know, at 20 years old or whatever. Right. Um, and then obviously today, like everybody wants it now kind of instant gratification. That's just not the way it works. Right. Yeah. There's a, um, you, you know, I think you can, well, this is where I think I got lucky. I found an industry that was really good by accident. Right. Like I, I didn't, I, I can't say that I thought through you didn't grow up wanting to be a roofer. Yeah. Or, or even, <laughs> so, I mean, I grew up, so where I grew up rural, uh, kind of mid Atlantic in, out in on the Eastern shore of Maryland, everybody that had money and it wasn't like big money, but you know, upper middle class were watermen, farmers or construction workers, water? right? Uh, you know, like seafood industry. Oh, so it. crabs, shrimp, yeah, fish. Yeah. Boat guy. Um, so I, it's not like I didn't grow up in a city. So like my, you know, kind of expectations were kind of in those three fields. Right. Um, so I was in construction, you know, in high school and college and whatever. So that's just what I knew how to do. Um, and I, and I wasn't like super formally educated. So I wasn't getting into finance. I've learned finance throughout my career, but, right. um, but at this it, point, your, your, your knowledge of finance is pretty fucking high level. It, it is, it's but up you there have with- to, right. Cause if when you start selling businesses and buying businesses and, yeah. and, consolidating and um you just learn yeah, i've right? forcefully sat through a couple of his uh 
uh, we've been on the car on a road trip. <laughs> I've sat through hour long uh, conference calls of him with, with financing. And it's it's I mean, it's high, high level knowledge of, of, of finance and, and just business as a whole. And you didn't study business. No. Nope. Right. This is all stuff that which I think like to me, that's the point. Right. Like you don't have I, I've been talking to people and especially with my kids right now, like kind of going back and forth, like, you know, it, does it make sense to send them to college? It, I mean, we don't. My wife and I don't believe that it, the juice is worth the squeeze, so to speak. But yeah. um, I think you have to be really intentional about like being able to source the knowledge from somewhere. And what I worry about is like, like that's me. Like I, I'm always looking for kind of the next thing I can learn. But if your kids aren't like that, like if it's, if it's not part of their personality, then you're like, okay, well, maybe they do need to be in this structured environment. So yeah, I kind of go back and forth on yeah. that. Yeah, and when we, when you had the lefty stuff that we were talking about a little while ago, and and I didn't know we're well, that I, today. I yeah, They're Richard's telling me it's, it's always been like that. Yeah. Even that, though. No. Yeah, Richard always. said it's always been like that. It's, so it's, it's just not. it's just the ratio is skewed significantly more that way. I think social media brings it out more. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember what it was. It was it was a book written by a centrist and a guy on the left about college, talking about how the ratio of left leaning professors to right when 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 um, a survey was sent out was like seven to one. And now it's like 49 to 1 or something like that. I mean, my brother knows. Yeah, but it, it makes sense, though, right? Because down. Well, professors are just people that have never done anything, right? And they tell you how to do stuff, right? So it's just like a government bureaucrat, <laughs> right. right? They've never actually so, – so they – you know, somebody with that personality has a tendency to like that back to, to school, be, the back no, to school absolutely. movie. Right. All absolutely. the professors are like, fuck these guys. They're, we're <laughs> signing off. I mean <laughs> – <laughs> it, it, it's kind of it's kind of like it's kind of like my general contractor's license. When I go for for C for my general contractor's license, the classroom is a sausage fest. It's all dudes. Now nothing precludes a woman from getting a general, but there is a tendency that that particular type of occupation tends to bring in a certain demographic. I think it's the same thing with with uh, college professors that it's just that type of um, structure appeals to people that have certain political leanings. I think those two things actually mm -hmm. cobble together. So, um, sure. so, so going back to, to, uh, um, what do you think? Okay. So you started off in, in, in construction. So, so yeah. I, so in high school, I was a Mason early college. I was a Mason. I, um, you know, I go to college. Um, I, I get fed up with this professor and I'm like, I can't sit here and do this. There, there was a couple little legal issues in there at the same time. <laughs> um, and I had a buddy that worked for, uh, I don't think down here you guys have Ryan Holmes, but they're like a yeah, yeah, top we got 10 Ryan. builder. We got up, up north country. a little bit, like Central so Florida. He, he was a superintendent for Ryan Holmes, and uh, they were struggling with uh, finish carpenters. And I had never done it before, but I'm like, fuck it, I can figure this out, right? It's, it's <laughs> hang trim on a Okay, but let's not overlook that. That right there, I think, is if there was a gene Hastings for self-employed people, if it, and, and, and I'm sure if it's studied, it is. It's the, the figure I'll, it out. Figure. I'll, okay, I'll do it and I'll figure it out later. Yeah. These professor types are like, let me figure it out first and then I'll do it. You know what happens? They never fucking do it. Yeah. So that, that there's I, a gene. Look, I, I have employees all the time that I'm like, you are, I mean, if you just had a little bit of confidence and we're like, fuck it, I'll figure it out. Right. Sky's the limit. They just, it's just not. In it's their, not in their DNA. I mean, yeah. it's just not. Yeah. So. It's funny. I, I just, on that exact point, I, I saw a guy. Man, where, where did I see this? I was just watching a guy talk about how from the minute you walk into school, they beat out the entrepreneurial yeah, spirit the creative from you. Like the they, they, it's like school is like designed to make you a worker, create employees. And the reason for that is because like, for example, the I, I want to say it was like it's the either public education trust or something like that, like the, the original like the government is going to get involved in education was started by Henry Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one of the guys like famous phrases was that I'm not in the business of creating business owners. I need to create employees. Yep. And it's like, everything is set up to, to help you be a good employee, a but good not, rule follower. right. But yeah, not to be like an entrepreneur. So it's like, you know, the guy that was having, it was on Instagram. I think now that I remember and the guy that's like having the, the speech about this, he's like, think about it. You got to raise your hand to take a piss. It's like, hey, can I go to the bathroom? And it's like, can I go to the bathroom? I got to fucking take a piss. You know what I mean? Like, what the fuck is this? And um, I mean, obviously you need some structure, but but it's funny you say that because people, they just, it's yeah. in them that they can't, they just can't do it. They, they don't think that way. You know, they don't, it's like, they want to be told what to do. By the way, own. no matter, because I've had, I have these people here. 
remember, I train people for a living at the end. I recruit them. <coughs> so I interview. There's not one agent. We got 500 agents. There's not one agent that I haven't interviewed. That's the one thing I don't miss no matter what. I delegate the fuck out of everything. I interview every single person that comes into this. Do you do um, predictive index? No, it, it might I be tried. too hard to do. With I did, I did try it, and it never worked. And my predictive in, at this point, it's in. My, I, I could tell you pretty much. I mean, I'm wrong every once in a while, but I could tell you who has it and who doesn't. You know, and who who has the mentality and it, and it. And I'm telling you, the it, IT guys. I, so I, I, at one of my companies, we just started doing it really heavily. All, all high, not field guys, but but all middle management and up. And um, at first, and I hadn't had a ton of exposure because I didn't come from corporate America. At first, I was like, "This is bullshit. You can answer your own question." Like, you know. <laughs> Uh, but I will tell you, it is, at least in my experience so far, it, it's a game changer in terms of yeah. one balancing your team, particularly leadership team, right? Because if everybody's a you know Alpha the same it's thing, disaster, it's yeah. not you know. It, um, but two, it it, it helps, and I'm not like I don't not hire somebody because they're in a certain category necessarily. But you know who they are. You categorize. It, you it categorize helps you them. watch out and help you know helps you work on their career development. What do I need to What do I need to help him with or her with or whatever? So. I, I think it's pretty interesting, actually. Put them, yeah. in, put them in the right place. Yeah, put them in the right place and pair them with the, you know, whatever Set their the career development up is. And everything because up. they're they're telling you. I mean, through that predictive index, they're telling you what they are good at or aren't good at. Right. Yeah. So, um, and what environment they need to be in and that kind yeah. of thing. So it's um, I, I'm, you know, early days, but pretty big believer. In it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I've I've I've, tr I've tried it. Uh, we had a questionnaire in the whole situation, and it ended up being wrong more than it was right. Really. And to me, remember, you got to hire these people. They're t my, for me, they're 1099s. Right. So it's they're if so I'm it's wrong, low, low I can sit back and watch the experiment <laughs> right. and see, right. oh, oh, fuck, right. I was yeah, wrong. That's true. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's not really going to cost not, me anything. You also got to remember, most of the people that Jesus is giving these questions to, like, they don't speak the language. So they probably didn't know what the fuck they were answering anyway. I mean, listen, right uh, <laughs> the, the language, he, he keeps on saying that, but the language here is Spanish. That's the fucking, that's, that's what he's getting your, wrong. Your index, <laughs> your index question was in, your questionnaire was in Spanish? Probably, yeah. A lot of my stuff is in Spanish. Um, all right, meetings so, are I know because yeah, I never know what the hell's all going my on. meetings, <laughs> dude. You know that. How many classes have you given here in English? No, no, I know it's right, horrible. exactly. It's so, horrible. um, before this, I don't want to, I don't want to get, I don't want to get in it with this guy. He's triggering me. To try to get <laughs> <in my mind. laughs> so I am more mature oh, now, and I see it coming. So I'm going to go ahead and ignore it and continue yeah, with the interview. Just the word trigger. I was about to say it's about myself. I was about to say I'm disturbed by your use of the word triggering, bro. Hey, I feel a little thirsty. Hey, at this point. Are you turning? <laughs> no, <I'm not. laughs> All right, so Ryan Holmes. So yeah, so then I, I start hey, doing. Turn the fucking uh, AC on, please. I start doing. Uh, Crank it all the way down. Uh, interior carpentry for Ryan Holmes. I hire a couple guys. Um, didn't know shit. One how to do the work, and two how to run it. Right, so you, they, you didn't get hired by them. You they hired your comp. You started a company real quick. Yeah, and started, started hiring guys. Started LLC. So you, that's where you're self employed. Yeah, right? and and started, at what age? At what? Nineteen twenty. I was yeah nineteen. All right. Yeah. So this is where I learned like the valuable lesson of DSOs. So, um, Ryan, DSO? uh, day sales order. So how, how quickly you can convert cash. Right. So well, the way Ryan Holmes works or any of these big track builders is they take these little subs, they drag them out 90, 120 days, find some reason why not to pay you. So, um, 100%. what ended up happening there was I, it, I quickly realized like I couldn't actually make money doing this. Like they're, they're just, you were just making wages basically. Um, so I, I left, I started doing some custom building, still residential, um, met a guy who had just sold a business, um, a fiber cement business to the roofing industry, basically. Um, and he wanted to invest some money, build some spec homes, whatever. Um, so we started building spec homes, market tanked a little bit. He got skittish, bailed out. Um, and I was kind of left with the skill set, but no real sustainable business. So, um, I went to work for the company that he sold uh, roofing materials or sold his business to the sold roofing materials. Um, so then over the next course of, you know, I guess eight, 10 years or so, I kind of hopped around a lot within that roofing industry and in sales. Um, I was single at the time. So most of the companies, what they would do with me is they would, I could move around. So they would send me into a region that was had a screwed up sales channel. I would fix it, and move on to the next. So I spent time in New York, um, Atlanta, right, but Tampa. You're, you're technically starting from the ground up. You're starting. Yeah. You're, you're, I mean, like it's all the way in the body. You started with materials and then, first. And then, and then, yeah, and materials. And then I realized, well, the guys actually making money are the contractors. So I need to get closer to that. 
Um, so I went from the manufacturer down to distributors to reps, you know, kind of held all these different positions, all while kind of learning the entire industry. And I think I, t I tell the story nonstop to acquisitions or whatever. But the, the unique thing about my experience was, and this is true of any fragmented business, is a guy told me one time, all these guys are doing it differently and all of them are going to win. Right. So that's roofing. That's HVAC. That's anything. Right. So, you know, there's roofers that do big box Walmart. There's guys that do government. There's guys that do, you know, residential, residential whatever. Right. Yeah. And they're all going to win. They're all going to make money. Well, but coming from the kind of the manufacturer side, I got to see how they all did things and then ultimately decide, you know, start to imprint how I would run a roofing company if I ever owned one. Um, so anyway, I, I met my wife in Florida. We moved back to Maryland. I didn't know you met her in Florida. In Tampa, yeah. Oh, okay. um, moved back to Maryland. Um, I started a rep firm selling materials. Um, ultimately, one of my customers had kind of his right hand leave. They were a small, you know, four million ish in revenue, um, multifamily re roof contractor. Um, had his right hand leave. Couldn't find a replacement. Asked me to buy the business. I bought the business. Sold my rep business. Bought that business. Scaled it. And then ultimately sold it to private equity, um, at which I'm actually still involved with. But. Right. One one thing. So one thing that you know, I'm assuming there's going to be entrepreneurs listening to this, right? So one thing that we talked about the other day that I found very interesting, right? Because um, you 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 you're you've been on both sides of it. Right? You 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 prepped your company to be sold, yeah. right? Like it, it, you had to like make changes to it and the way you ran it and the way you structured it. In order, you don't, you run, one thing you, you, you mentioned was you run, there's two ways to run a company, just to run it, right? To make money and then to prepare it to be sold, right? Correct. Talk a little bit about that. Like, you know, what, what's yeah. the difference between just, you know, running a mom, mom and pop shop to preparing a company to be sold, to be able to be um, attractive enough for these yeah, so private I would equity say guys? That's a kind of a two-part question, right? There, there's things you have to do. Like, so if you're selling a house, you get a stage the house, you get a paint, you know, yeah. that, that stuff has to happen no matter what you do. But- to maximize value, particularly in an institutional capital world, right? So if you're trying to sell to a financial buyer, right? So whether that be, you know, you know a sponsor, private equity, whatever it is, um, you know, those guys aren't operators. All they want to do is either infuse cash, so capital or uh, human capital, right? People and scale the business. So the, the key in maximizing value is creating a scalable business um, that is, you know, has it's not overly complicated, right? You do one thing, you do it well, you can throw cash at it. And right. So I got five offices now and this yeah. is how I got to five and this is how we'll get to six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. And you got to be able to tell the story and, and you have to, they have to believe that if they just throw cash at it, it will flourish. Right. Um, so what I see, cause I, I do a lot, that's primarily what I do now is mergers and acquisitions. Right. Cause once you sold, now you're looking at, cause you, you didn't sell all of it. You sold a portion of it. Now yeah. you're looking to buy. So yeah, we're still you're, building the platform. You're out there hitting, right? yeah, you're out there hitting people up and looking at companies and and figuring out if you're going to buy them or not, right? Yep. You're and, diving and deep into in that it. business and and, a, and and some others too. But yeah. um, what I see people do, and, and this is, look, I get it, right? Um, if you are a um, if you're running a business with no intention of selling it in a local market, you're just kind of thinking of how can I make more money? What do I like to do? That type of thing. So as an example, you know, I looked at a company in Southwest Florida that had. You know, they were primarily a roofer, but they had a crane business and an HVAC business and a little bit of residential business. And which, if you're just running, you know, it's in great. your own little yeah. market, you're trying to do income, as much. Right. That's fine. The problem is your message is diluted and it's not scalable. So you're diminishing your value from a from a financial sponsor. Um, you know, because uh, they don't, you know, they don't want to do ten things. They want to do one thing and throw money at it and make right. it blow up. Right. So I think. I think if you're if you're trying to set your company up to maximize value, that's one thing. Um, the other thing that you just have to do generally is, which which most kind of small business and entrepreneurs don't do, is you know financial management, financial literacy, and clean books, and month end hard closes within ten days, and you know so there's some key positions that companies don't have that they all need to have, right? You need to have a, a CFO or, or at least a really strong controller. Um, and the other thing that happens a lot of times in small business, which was true of mine, was the business was dependent on me. Um, so it's like super kind of owner operator centric, which, uh, you know, my opinion always was until I went to sell was 
well, that's the way to maximize profits, right? Which is true, right? If, if I have my hands on everything, I can maximize profits. Which is true, correct. Um, and I didn't care about work-life balance. I, I think that's the biggest bullshit fucking term I've ever heard of. Right? But <laughs> um, if you want work-life balance, go work for somebody. Um, so that wasn't an issue for me. But um, uh, so I never really was. But just, to dive into that a little, because, because you know, um, there's there's one way that people put it. Look, if if you're in your if you're if you have to be in your business every single day, you have a job, right? If if you if you set up your business so that if you could you could leave and it runs without you, you have a business, right? I agree. Well, and the that's other basically, thing is too, that's basically you, you can't advance out. if you're not you can't work you can't work in the business. You have to work on the on business. the business. Yeah. yeah. Um, however, the same thing though. If you're the if there's nobody near your level of you know kind competency. of competency in your organization you are not going to maximize your value because you know that's risky right it's just risky right what if you die the business fucking yeah. dies um so that that's typically what you see in these lower middle market businesses it was true of mine um it's not today um but it, it's just one of those things that people just don't get to so um now, and, you- and by the way you live out of the business in all the wrong ways like you know like it's like you said it's clean books like it's like listen you know, law firm, unfortunately, small small practice like I used to maintain is not something you can sell, because the reality of the matter is that I'm the business. Yeah. Right. So you know, and so what happens is it's like when when you're looking when someone's looking to buy the business, right, and they're looking at the the financials. You know, there's all these things that the buyers consider an ad back. Mm-hmm. Right. So, oh, right now, Richard pays his car out of the business. But when we buy the business and Richard's not here, then like Richard's car is not here. So if we're spending a 100 grand a year on Richard's car, you can add that back to the bottom line. Yeah. OK, but the problem is like you have to replace the Richard. Right. So like what do you replace it with? And and does it cost more? Or does it cost less? So it's like it's kind of like what you're saying, you know, that the, the business has to be able to operate independent of like any one set of of either one person or one set of persons. You have to be able to like have interchangeable parts. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's actually one of the key ideas my father left me with because my father ran a very big industrial operation in New York City for you know, 40, 50 years. He said the last skill, the hardest one to learn is the ability to duplicate yourself. The ability to take and make yourself irrelevant so that you can go on to the next thing or work on other things while everything is, st- all the plates are still spinning. Yeah, and I, I think that, so so here's my my thought or experience on that. I, I, that. I think that's a utopian concept, right? Because you can't, and then this is where people get hung up. I certainly got hung up here. You can't replace yourself, right? I mean, you, you can you can replace yourself at, you know, 80, 70%, right? right. But you can't replace yourself, um, it, typically in a business. W- where I got hung up and most people get hung up is that once you scale, if you're replacing yourself at 80% and you're scaling, like, yeah, you're going to lose some efficiency. You're going to lose some you know, maybe some margin slip or whatever it is, but if you can do 10 times more, yeah. make up and that's what I couldn't get comfortable yeah. with when I was a small business. And that's where most people get on. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm not going to give up. If I can make, you know, 10 more points, but I can only do, you know, $10 million of the revenue, then. Well, I, I think, and, and it's one, I, I see it a lot in the training that I do. Agents, they get locked into perfectionism. Like yeah. it's got to be perfect. Yeah. And I say, I, I've Don't always like said enough, perfectionism great is a trap. Yeah. It is a trap. And it's actually a self-limiting belief that gives you an excuse for doing less than you're capable of. It's like, oh, I can't send it out unless it's perfect. That yeah. excuses your lack of volume, right? Yeah. And so for me, excellence is what's pursued. I pursue excellence ruthlessly, and whatever I have to do to get as much quality product out as I possibly can, yeah. that's the only path forward. I don't know if yeah. that jobs what you're saying, but it sounds so Yeah, good. no, no, I, and I, you know, we have an adage, don't let great get in the way of good enough in our <laughs> organization. <laughs> right. um, and, uh, the only caveat to that is you run into it, particularly in the construction industry, you run into a lot of businesses that are run by people that aren't business people and their goal, their priorities were never, it, it actually, I think it parallels to kind of conservative versus Democrats in many cases, right? It, their priorities are just different, right? Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, and I, that's probably a long slippery slope to go down, but if you're a craftsman, yeah, slippery slope right? to the right guys. Yes. <laughs> yeah. If you're a craftsman and you don't, care about scaling a business or prop, you know, th- there's a lot of those too. That, sure. So they're like, well, I want it to be perfect because that's, you know, that's the goal. You know, my goal is profit, right? Yeah. Um, now you have to maintain quality, obviously, to have sustainable profit as well. But It's just the order of priority. Um, yeah, the order of priority. That, I see that too. But um, 
you're right though. You definitely see people that, um, you, you know, they, they at least say they want to scale and grow a business. And then they and, and personality wise, um, I mean, you're, you're, you know, hung out with you enough to know you're pretty goddamn good at reading people too. Like when, when you get, when you, when you're, you know, meeting with these people and you're looking to buy their company, I mean, is there a personality trait that you're looking because you're going to have to be a little bit married to them for a while because you don't just get rid of them right away. I mean, they, you don't buy uh, on tuck-ins and add-ons. We certainly do. We, I'd prefer to have rollover equity because you know, they're running a business unit ideally or a second man up. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, look, if, if I, I don't have as much personality as, you know, cultural fit, right. I can't take a company that's not, you know, we're super direct kind of a locker room type atmosphere, get it done, you know, have big show, broad shoulders, tough skin. <laughs> If it's a super soft company, it's just going to fail when they integrate it. So, I mean, I, I do look at that, um, you know, all of the kind of the way it's put together on a tuck in. So, so there's two types of acquisitions that happen in the, in the private equity or institutional capital world. There's platforms. So that's, you know, a bigger company that somebody can get behind growing. And then there's just tuck ins, a tuck in or add on. You don't care that, that much about how well put together they are because you have the platform you're going to bolt it to. Right. Um, you, it also garners less uh, in terms of value. So um, I, I think it just kind of depends on, on what, what you're looking at. Right. So it's not really a personality thing. It's just more like the way they've run their company and with their culture. It would be yeah, a the culture. Most, the probably most... the biggest thing. Are they going to be able to take my managers because they've been white gloved for 10 years? Type right. Thing? Are they going to, yeah, they're going to be able to take orders from your guys yeah. basically at yeah. the end of the day. So, so the tack on would be something like uh, if it's a market that they have that they're in, that you want to get into kind of thing. Is that what we're, that so I add on, I, I'll give you an example, right? So um, the, the original company that I sold was in, in the mid Atlantic. We were the platform. Banker to the we, stars. We've now. added a couple other acquisitions that are tuck ins to the platform. So now they operate under our banner. Mm -hmm. um, so the, all the senior leadership, the C suite, shared services functions sit at the platform company. The tuck ins are usually smaller, less sophisticated, don't have, you know, they're on QuickBooks, they're, you know, that type of thing. So that, that's kind of the difference. And you bring them in. You bring them in. What just to expand into other markets? That, that's kind of my question. What would be the bringing? Yeah. Bring them in? So the, the whole name of the game in in you know, institutional capital is um, is obviously growing equity value, but it's kind of the playbook is double EBITDA in a certain period of time, um, and then get a couple additional turns of of multiple. So the way you do that is either is really to have predictable revenue. So that can be through. So in my case, to answer your question more directly, geographic diversification is a big, you know, is a pillar of our strategy. Sure. So I'm, I'm not buying companies in the markets I'm in. I'm buying them in other markets. Um, and then the other piece is kind of diversifying revenue a little bit. That way you're, you're minimizing risk. So we're, we're buying some companies that do some other adjacent but slightly different things than we do mm. in other markets. Um, let, and that let me ask you this. Because, should, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, yeah. but it's, I've been dealing with a, with a new group of um, clientele, let's call it, that is high net worth individuals, okay, that they think that what they want to do is acquire companies, okay? But what I what I find is the problem is that it's like, number one, they, we, you know, we all suffer from the, when you're buying, everything is worthless, and when you're selling, everything is worth a zillion yeah. mentality, okay? And then th there's a, an incredible level of impatience, are they operators? No. So why don't they just invest in a fund? Well, and because they're control freaks. And so when you put money in a fund, you're nobody. Okay, you're one of many. Well, but there's plenty of small funds. They yeah. get GP, whatever. I, so, so I guess my well, my, my well, my question is, is when you acquire a business that, like you say, I just want to put, I want to put money behind it so that the business can grow. What is your like timeline on the return? What is like an acceptable return? You're going to buy something for 10 million bucks. How long are you, do you, and is it okay to wait for the 10 million to come back before now you're making money on that? Yeah, it's all, there's no cash flow in any of this, right? Right, so, right. And, and for me, and this is all personal preference, right? For me, the business that I sold that I still own 48% of, um, it's a traditional private equity fund. So they're, you know, they've, they've taken capital from institutional, you know, pension funds, whatever, right? And their horizon is about 10 years from the from the raise of the capital to exit. <laughs> um, we will exit probably in four years, um, three to four years. 
Um, so it just depends how quickly you can get, but the runway is generally 10. I have another one that I, that I'm doing privately that I, in, in pool construction business <clears throat> that, cause I'm doing two things at once and, and it's, it's my capital. I don't have to return it to anybody. Um, I'm taking that one a little slower just because, you know, but you're, but, but, but it actually went faster anyway. Well, it, it, <laughs> right. it, 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 it was a, shit yeah. show when i bought it and right. i they the people i put in place fixed it in a year but we haven't really done it you were okay waiting 10 years but it came back a lot faster than <laughs> yeah. well but and not just that but the other thing i'm hearing too is that like when you deploy the capital it's actually not just sat in this this company's bank account but the it's used to make improvements right. and bring in the correct people and and so you're spending the money initially I'm just validating the, the things the right that, I, that I complain yeah. to my superiors about because it's like, oh, well, we're going to buy this for. They just wanted a new. We're going to buy it for fifty bucks, and then we got to put in another fifty bucks to make it work. And I'm like, yeah, that's typically the you know because it's not working. Like, what the fuck do you so want to buy? Not Disney World? Any, um, <laughs> so they're not using any. Typically, what people do is they they buy a company with equity and they finance growth with debt. So, mm -hmm. if I'm your clients, right, I I'm buying a company with equity, whatever it is, right. And then you have to have the capital partners in place to finance the growth with debt because financing growth with equity is a bad use of capital, right? Because it's, you know, for all the reasons that you're saying. Sure. So it sounds to me like they don't have the right debt partners to. Yeah. Or know, even the appetite the or, or just the, again, again, I think it's more it's, the appetite. It's, it's conceptual yeah. understanding. I mean, yeah, it's it, the I, conceptual understanding because it's like, dude, it's like, guys, what do you, well, but what do you think? Were you fucking a, a, a business printing cash? You're going to buy it cheap and you're going to get your money back in a year and it's going to hit you in the head with cash. It's just not the way it fucking works. It, it, it's amazing to me. especially. I also don't like, I'd never buy a business looking to get any cash flow out of it. Like if there's cash flow, fine, we're probably going to reinvest it anyway. My whole deal is on the egg. I don't right. anticipate anything. Right. 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 That's that's the building way. for the exit. Yeah. It, it amazes me how how poorly understood debt really is. The idea that you can get somebody to agree to a, a payment, and regardless of the upside, I get to participate in a hundred percent of the upside side, and their payment stays the same. Yeah. I mean, what we've seen in real estate. I mean, in real estate, it's people on their homes they put three and a half percent down, but they're experiencing appreciation on 100% of the purchase price of the asset yeah. with only 3.5% of the capital. Back. You know, you, you, the use of debt. OPM, using, baby. It's, Other people's it's money. just such a beautiful thing, and uh, especially when you have mm -hmm. the confidence that you do to grow the business. I know I'm going to beat the, rate, the, the the percentage, the interest rate on, on, on the growth. Why would I let this, a partner participate in that? Why yeah. wouldn't I use debt? No, I'm, I'm with you, man. That's awesome. Yeah, but, it, right. And, but I mean, that's a whole skill in industry, too, is, is having the right, you know, Debt partner, yeah, and, yeah. You know, the right structure, knowing what market is. Right now, it's getting crazy with that. So, so before um, before selling your okay, so because I again being with you as much as I am and, and and hearing your conversations, I mean, you guys are fucking as corporate as corporate gets. I mean, you guys are. I don't. Know. There's well, a lot more corporate. <laughs> I mean, you're pretty fucking corporate. So, so my question is, right? Um, did you corporate yourself before you sold, or selling has made you both? I did what I could stomach to do right. before we sell. Um, and because look, some of it's real, like some of it's positions that help you grow. Some of it's just insurance, it. basically. Right. Um, also, you know, again, like like I said about the kind of entrepreneur, middle market guy getting in his own way. Like, so I just hired um, a COO that's taking over as CEO, and I'm stepping back to an exec chair role beginning of the year. And um, I ha we hired this guy, um, and it was kind of my idea. I wanted to do this anyway. But I am every day. I'm impressed with how fucking awesome this dude is. Like how good he is. How much better than me he is. <laughs> That's um, awesome. <laughs> now there's stuff. There's industry stuff that he doesn't know. Whatever. But um, you know, in terms of kind of corporate, you know, if there are really talented people out there that right. you, like will accelerate your business. And knowing, being open to finding them, knowing how to find them find them and paying them yeah i mean is is yeah paramount yeah so you 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 did i did know. a little bit but not a ton like so we, i did we always had really strong financial control and management um we had a you know a, a little bit of a disjointed tech stack we completely upgraded that post close i never had an hr person they brought that know. or you had an idea of what you wanted to bring because you're you're because you, it we okay. did it they didn't bring anything but we collectively like in order to 
create multiple expansion to be able to buy, as an example, right? Say you own a company in town A and I'm in town B. Right. Your that's a big part. Your integration, your technology integration. integration is a big part. Yeah. It, it is because it's that's the scalable part, right? And, and, that's and that, you continue right. to just bolt that everybody's stuff connected on. and everybody's communicating yeah. and everybody's speaking on the same yeah. channel, right? So that's stuff that you didn't and it have drives before. efficiency and because there's st you know at ten million dollars, there's things you can do, the ways you can run a business. You can't run a hundred million dollar business the same way, so you need technology. Yeah. Um, so you know that all came you know after the acquisition. Um, I knew it. I just we weren't there. Um, I, so I would say I guess to maybe circle back on that. Most of the stuff, most of the stuff you see today riding in the car with me, is <laughs> post acquisition. Right. Oh, like all that, right, right, right. Including largely most of my understanding of finance. Right. Not accounting. Like right. you, got, you, you always got to know accounting if you're running business, but the finance side. Um. Last thing, uh, well, you you got to you got you, you're not going to be for, for the JC one. I would love to be. It, okay. it just depends on when we All do right. it. Um, what's the coolest? Okay, so two two more questions to wrap it up. Um, what is? Did you think you were going to be as successful as you are? No, no clue. Right. I, I, what was what was your? Oh shit, man! If I can do. By the way, I don't even think you said his name. Michael Gal. I didn't. I said. Oh yeah, you're right. All right, Mike, Michael Gal. I'll put it. I'll put it on all the. I'll put it on all the. Uh, I'll put it on all. I didn't. People are like, said JC who either. is the wizard? <laughs> people are listening. Like, well, who the fuck no. is this guy? <laughs> I, I, I've been on thirty some odd episodes. Nobody's heard my first name. <laughs> yeah, he's right. That's true. <laughs> so I bought. I, I'll tell you how little I knew about where it was going. When I bought the company, the the roofing company, uh, we'll, we'll talk about. Um, I bought it at four million in revenue. It was a strong company, had had good margins, but tiny, right? Ton customer concentration was like eighty percent. Um, and I wrote a business plan, um, and I wrote it up to uh, sixteen million in revenue, which I thought was kind of the sweet spot, you know, with what I knew at the time. Um, you know, and, and kind of verbatim, we achieved everything we wanted to along the way. But I went from we went from four million, just in terms of revenue, from four million. To 45 million in seven years and then you know we'll be 150 million this year so no i had no idea and i never the reason i sold had nothing to do with me wanting to monetize the business i wanted to go on an acquisition mode and 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 you like that part of it well i just the the we were working in geography and my guys were killing it and they were you know 20 percent year over year right but it growth. seems like almost like you you're Dude, you know, like you're, you're, yeah, the roofing was the vehicle to get for you to get to what you really like and what you really enjoy, which is buying fucking companies and restructuring. Is that fair to say? Um, so, so I like it. I, I like operating businesses too, though. I, I love, like, so, like, this new venture, the, the pool company, like, I like lower middle market because it's just, it's so easy, right? There's low hanging fruit. Like, little companies do shit wrong. They do shit wrong and it's so easy to fix it. So I, I like operating companies. But to build like significant wealth, you know, and yeah. you're just playing with more chips when you start right. buying companies and scale. I mean, the the arbitrage that you get when you when you buy companies is, I mean, yeah. the, you know, and the day after you close, you just made thirty million dollars. Yeah, okay. um, just because of the arbitrage. Yeah. yeah. So uh, la last last question: What you know? Because look, you know, it, it it all sounds pretty right now, and and look, I get it with my agents all the time. Like they're like, oh. You know, they'll throw like, oh, you're leaving at three o'clock. Like, motherfucker, you weren't here when I was waking up fucking five o'clock in the morning, working 14 hours, the whole situation, you know. So it's kind of like, you know, it, it, it's it's real cool to look at it now and, and, and see your lifestyle now and the whole situation. But there's a lot of fucking hard work and a lot of sacrifice to get it right. So what's that that one moment that you're like, fuck, man, it was really all fucking worth it. I mean, you know, like, what's that one cool moment? I think I think I know what it is, but, you know, like, what's that one, you know, like, holy shit. You know, so I actually have never had one. It's funny. So when we, and, and look, when I sold, we were making, you know, 10, $15 million in profit a year. So it's not like I didn't have money yeah. going up to selling. Um, but I was in the keys with my wife when, yeah, that's, when that's the, the, one, that's the story I was thinking. <laughs> when, you know, when it actually closed, right? And my CFO sends me the wire transfer, you know, yeah. like a picture, a snapshot of it. Um, and, and we were sitting at a, eating a cheeseburger at just lunch place 
and uh, it was it was actually anti kielbasa because I was like, eh, I don't feel any different today than I did yesterday. <laughs> yeah. But cheeseburger I, doesn't taste any different. It, it, it is the reason, though. But it's much I, cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> I say this all the time: is for me, money was never the goal. Money was the scoreboard. Right. Yeah, yeah. So like, I don't do things. I, I don't. I don't operate in, in, in to try to get the next you know, dollar or whatever. I just that's just the scoreboard. I just want to be the best in every business I have, or you know, uh, whatever it is. Um, so I, I don't. I thought it would be like, oh shit, oh, this shit. is really cool, yeah. but it really wasn't. So I, you know, I wish I had a cooler story than that. But no, no, I, I kind of knew. I kind of knew that was the story, and I kind of, you know. So, all right, man. Um, any any questions, guys? You guys have no, really great meeting you, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right, gal. Thanks, bud. Appreciate cool. it.